Welcome to Bloomberg ETF IQ Europe. I'm Francine Lacroix, and over the next 30 minutes, we'll be your guide to the region's 1 trillion euro market in exchange traded funds. Everything you need to know about the funds and the flows. Warren Buffett gets into ETFs for the first time. Berkshire Hathaway discloses holdings in two exchange-traded funds. We'll ask if there's more to come. Vanguard takes a sip. One of the world's biggest ETF providers wades into the UK's self-invested pension market. How far will it shake up the industry? And making a mint for the first time in its 1,000-year history, the Royal Mint is launching an exchange-traded product. We'll discuss the growth of gold. So let's kick off with the news that the world's number two ETF provider is getting into the UK pension market. Vanguard claims its new self-invested personal pension scheme will cut the cost and complexity of saving for retirement. Well, let's get more now from our reporter, Ksenia Galuchko. Joining us for today's show is Andrew Jamieson. He is Managing Director and Global Head of ETF Product at Citigroup. So thank you both for joining us. All right, I have a million questions about the story, Ksenia. First of all, why is Vanguard actually doing this? Will it be able to, to actually compete with other pension plans? Absolutely. This is really quite a game changer for the pension industry in the UK because with this uh, product, uh, Vanguard is now launching the the cheapest pension option. The fee will be only 0.15% and the, the maximum capped fee on all of the funds, not just on the pensions, but also on other investments in Vanguard products will be only £375 a year. Okay, so what will that mean for Vanguard's ETF business in the UK? So what's important here is that these pension products will be focused only on, on Vanguard's own funds, right? There won't be a diversity of other products. But that means that this will bring even more money into Vanguard ETFs. And in Europe, and especially in the UK, Vanguard is still trying to increase its market share. It's battling against UBS, against iShares, BlackRock. So there's really quite a competition. With this move, it could really increase its market share share. Um, Andrew, I love this show because it makes me smarter about uh, where European ETFs go. How, how bigger will this market be in Europe and in the UK? And I don't know what your time horizon is. Is it three years, five years, or do we need to wait 10 years? Sure. Well, I think obviously the, the market is continuing to grow uh, very rapidly. And I think what we've just touched on there is the uh, advance in retail. I think in Europe, unlike in the US, this has largely been an institutional story to date. So 90% of the market is owned by large institutional holders and there hasn't really been a retail market. Primarily that's been driven by uh, regulation that hasn't been kind to ETFs in terms of retrocessions, um, also in terms of technology and the ability to access the product. So taking someone like Vanguard who has a strong heritage in the B2C model and getting direct to the consumer, I think is very exciting. I think this will be uh, the type of advance we need in Europe to get ETFs really into a retail uh, context. So is it difficult to say, look, the market will be you know, twice as big, three times as big in 10 years because there are so many unknowns? I think that's fair. Uh, I mean, I, I don't have a crystal ball, but if you look <laughs> at the parallel in, in the U.S., that market is much more a 50-50 split between institutional and retail. And in Europe, it's much more institutional, as I just touched on. So if you see this as the opening gate of the retail market, could it double? For sure. I think that's definitely a possibility. Yeah. Is the UK good compared to, to Europe? Is this like the, the hot thing or is it more difficult? It is the hot thing. And as we've discussed a few weeks ago, uh, UK assets are really seeing a turnaround now that there is more political certainty after Brexit. And Vanguard is really betting on this market to drive its European ETF and in general mutual fund business. It's a good Great. place to start. It's a good place to start. This is why we're also starting the show on it. Xenia Galuchko there <laughs> joining us. Uh, thank you. And Andrew Jamieson from Citigroup uh, stays with us. Now let's take a look at what's hot in the world of ETFs this week. Which countries and sectors have been attracting the money? Danny Berger has been looking at the numbers. Hi Danny. Hi Francine. I have your weekly view of FFLO Go. And this is globally listed ETFs that track European countries. 
Topping the list in terms of inflows this week is France, $335 million coming in to the country. This is all really due to just one BlackRock iShares ETF, seeing a record inflow on Wednesday. Now, number two uh, is going to be Italy. Francine, you know better than anyone, a really interesting banking consolidation story happening in Italy, maybe making this more of a draw. Interestingly, Germany over here getting a rare reprieve from outflows. Germany on track to see nearly $1 billion in ETF tracking outflows. But this week, getting some inflows. Overall, we did see European ETFs get more money this week. So the total figure comes to about half a billion dollars coming into European ETFs. A really interesting time to be putting your money into Europe tracking funds, considering the earnings impact of coronavirus. We've heard a lot of warnings. Goldman Sachs warning of a correction, saying European companies are twice as exposed to coronavirus as the S&P 500. But investors aren't swayed for now, still putting their money in Europe tracking ETFs, Francine. Danny, thank you so much. Uh, what a great look at, uh, the, well, what a great way to look at ETFs. The legendary investor Warren Buffett now is finally getting into ETFs for the first time. Berkshire Hathaway has disclosed holdings in two exchange traded funds in one of its pension plans. So could Berkshire, which holds a record $128 billion in cash and U.S. Treasuries, actually make more use of ETFs. Well, let's get more on this with Andrew Jamieson from Citigroup. Um, Andrew, actually, what's the attractiveness, right, for someone like, I mean, you know, we're not inside Berkshire Hathaway, so we don't really know, but d d would it make sense for someone the size of Berkshire Hathaway to be looking at this? Well, it's a surprise and not a surprise at the same time. So on the one hand, it's a surprise that he's never done this before. And we think of, you know, Barcher and Warren in particular as great active investors and selecting securities that they feel that have uh, the opportunity to grow in the long term so an index fund feels the absolute opposite of that but at the same time he's a great supporter of America of the S&P 500 and he has in, on numerous occasions written in his annual letter about the benefit of index investing and the low cost compounding benefit that it has so I guess this is really him putting his money where his mouth is albeit on a limited scale um, but I think it's encouraging and I think it just goes to show that ETFs are coming more and more into the mainstream and they are being used by large institutional investors for a multitude of different purposes. Uh, do you think those, you know, some large institutional investors in Europe will also take a, a, a much bigger and closer look at this market? Well, I think they already do, to be fair. Um, I think it's just not something that necessarily hits the headlines. Clearly, this is a story in itself because we don't think of Berkshire is holding ETFs, but you know, a, a great number of institutional investors in Europe are using ETFs for a multitude of purposes. You know, quite often they will use it as a cash, a cash equitization tool. In other words, they have money that's sitting parked, they don't know what to invest in, and rather than having that cash drag on their portfolio, they're investing in an ETF now, and therefore it's something that they have no emotional attachment to. It's quick, it's liquid, it's easy to get in and out, and we're seeing that more and more. And, and in many ways, we're seeing a huge growth in the ultra short uh, fixed income market where this is probably the nearest equivalent to a money market fund and that's certainly been a, a rapid expansion over the last couple of years. So Andrew what kind of I don't know if there's you know the ideal conditions for the European ETF market to grow but does it need to be less volatility on the markets does it need to be negative rates I mean does that spur demand for ETFs? No I, th I think to be honest it's doing pretty well I mean the growth has been stellar over you know the last 10 years it's continuing to grow I mean I see ETFs as more as a, a technology as opposed to That's really an asset class or a product and if you think about this it's just about the uh, the, the evolution of the marketplace it's the uh, mutual fund version 2.0 and people are taking advantage of this technology and saying the ability to transact with transparency, liquidity and low cost is something that's really attractive. Andrew, am I right in saying, I mean, you build it, right? You, you build some products or you have a team that build it. I'm not saying you build it. Or no, so, actually I don't. Kind of, um, so, but, so City don't actually uh, have their own ETF business at all. So what we do is we sit agnostically in the ecosystem and we support other issuers and we support the end investors. So we're doing everything from research, trading, derivatives, market making, right through to custody and administration to really support, as I say, all aspects of the life cycle. And we can help uh, clients navigate to best execution in terms of selecting ETFs. And we can help issuers bring out new and exciting products to, to meet that demand. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Andrew Jamieson there from Citigroup. He stays with us. Now, coming up, pessimistic about the euro. Well, there's an ETF for that as well. But is betting against a currency too much of a risk? We'll discuss that next. This is Bloomberg.
This is Bloomberg ETF IQ Europe. Everything you need to know about the funds and the flows. I'm Francine Lacqua. So are you pessimistic about the prospects for the euro? Every week we dig down into some of the exchange traded funds you may not have heard of. Here's Danny Berger with this week's There's an ETF for that. Hi, Danny. Hi, Francine. So let's say you're bearish the euro. Let's say that you're so bearish you're willing to put your money in a fund that gives you five times a short euro position. Well, there's an ETF for that. The fund is from SockGen and it uses swaps and derivatives to give, it, give its holders this ultra bearish euro position versus the dollar. Now, this inverse leveraged ETF is definitely not for the faint of heart. It's marketed as a product for sophisticated traders who are looking for a sort of tactical exposure. But many fear that these type of products will fall in the hands of retail investors who don't fully understand its risks. For example, these ETPs need to reset their leverage daily, which for mathematical reasons means that the returns start to erode the longer you hold it. But for now, this fund remains a tempting one with weakness in European growth, the common currency hitting a 2017 low. Francine? Danny, thank you so much. Our Danny Berger there now. So how useful are so-called leveraged ETFs and how risky are they for small investors? Well, still with us, Andrew Jamieson. He's Managing Director and Global Head of ETF Product at Citigroup. So, Andrew, first of all, how do you measure risk in an ETF? Um, that's a great question. I, mean, I think, for, first off, um, the, the challenge that we have in this industry is the term ETF is a bit of a catch-all. So, you know, as you mentioned there, there's an interchangeability between ETP, which is the correct definition, versus ETF. So in Europe, unlike in the U.S., uh, usage rules don't allow inverse levered products to exist. So that is technically an ETP and would be considered an alternative fund under AI FMD. Uh, which in itself means the barrier to entry for retail investors is much higher. So that in itself is a great protection. So it means that retail investors are unlikely to trade these. And as, as, as Danny also mentioned, um, these are quite complex in their nature and therefore are not something that you would use on a long and hold basis. So as a consequence, I think in terms of who are using these, sophisticated investors, it makes sense. They have a purpose. But I wouldn't necessarily recommend them as something that uh, the retail community would, would consider, to okay. be honest. Will it change as the, mar as, as the market matures? I don't think so, to be honest, because, again, proportionally, they are a very, very small component of the overall industry. You talk about a trillion dollars in Europe. These sort of uh, ETP products are really somewhere over just over a billion. So you're talking about a tenth of 1% of, of the market share. So I think they are a niche specialist product. They have their place but it's really not necessarily something that retail will take hold of. All right, Andrew, thanks so much. Let's pivot also to the launch of a new ETF from a very old institution for the first time in its 1,000-year history. The Royal Mint is issuing an exchange-traded product. Backed by gold stored in the Mint's vaults in South Wales, it'll be another entrant into the already crowded market for ETFs in the precious metal. Now, gold is certainly favored by investors at the moment. Exchange-traded funds have added gold for 22 straight days. Well, we're back with Andrew Jameson. Andrew, I mean, if you look at, you know, the, the linkage, between an ETF and gold, I mean, why not just buy gold? Well, I think there's a number of compelling reasons. So I think this is genuinely a very exciting advancement and, uh, you know, look forward to seeing how this product, product does. Um, clearly, there is a, a group of investors that feel gold is an important part of a diversified portfolio. There's also, you know, added concerns around the coronavirus and beyond the human impact, is this having uh, interruption into the, to, into the distribution chain and manufacturing? So clearly, there is a flight to safe haven assets. But what's really interesting about this, and I think it really resonates to a retail audience here in the UK, is that heritage of the Royal Mint, the security of knowing that it's in the Royal Mint's vault. But what's really interesting about this product is the fact that it is, it is not only physically backed, which a lot of ETFs are, but you can exchange for physical. So with this product, you can actually redeem it and take back gold bars or gold coins in, in, in small dominations. And therefore, that makes it a very interesting and exciting product for, for retail. Okay, it, it does, you know, does the appetite for gold ETFs increase from here, or is it just in, impossible to say? Well, I think it certainly makes it much more accessible. And sorry, to, to touch on your earlier point, like why the ETF as opposed to the gold itself? Well, I think in terms of the cost point, uh, it's something like 22 basis points. This is a very affordable and low-cost option. Also, it negates the cost of storage, because if you hold physical gold, not only do you have to find somewhere secure to hold it, you have to pay to hold it. And also, traditionally, the bid-offer spread on a, on a physical commodity could be quite wide. 
trade, whereas this will trade like a stock and will have contractual market makers. And as a consequence, will have quite a tight bid offer spread. And I think lastly, what's interesting about this product is it's um, been launched on a white label platform. So in the US, white label platforms are quite quite common. However, there's only one in Europe, Han ETF, and in collaboration, they've brought this to market quite quickly and efficiently. And that's, again, a great way of accessing the market for people who don't want to build a big, all-encompassing ETF platform to be able to do it through a white labeler. Um, Andrew, how important, you know, is the ETF for gold also that more exciting because it's Royal Mint? I mean, if it's attached to a name that people oh, recognize, it, yes, does think, it actually change that, that's, everything? That, that's to my point. It, it has huge retail uh, resonance. People will feel the security of it. It's a, it's a, a thousand-year-old organization. People will be very comfortable, and I could imagine that this will capture a lot of uh, retail flow. Andrew, thanks so much. Andrew Jamieson there from Citigroup stays with us. Now, still to come, two of the oldest names in asset management are getting together to create a firm with one and a half trillion dollars in assets. We'll discuss the consolidation upending the industry and what that means for investors. That's next. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg ETF IQ Europe. Everything you need to know about the funds and the flows. I'm Francine Lacroix. Now let's take a look at the ETFs which are attracting the money this week with your European leaderboard. Here's our Danny Berger. Hi, Danny. Hi, Francine. Well, the leader this week is one I mentioned at the top of the show looking at FFLO Go. This is a French ETF. It tracks the MSCI uh, France indexes and iShares ETF, seeing a record inflow on Wednesday. The other one's a little bit of a random gathering of ETFs. Yes, you have an emerging market govern, uh, government bond one here, a European bond, and the S&P 500. But I think the outflows are more interesting this week because one of the biggest outflows was a value ETF. And this is what's known as a smart beta ETF. So that's that last one there, the iShares. And this ETF essentially tracks the quant style uh, known as factors. They invest in characteristics that are shown to beat the market. In this case, value invests in cheaper stocks. And this has gotten punished so far this year. It's a very cyclical type of factor, and we've seen investors flee from it with all the coronavirus fears. In fact, it's gone so extreme, they're moving into low volatility in safer smart beta stocks. JP Morgan says that now the difference between this value factor and low volatility is twice as much as it was at the tech bubble. They call this a, uh, a bubble driven by these passive smart beta funds, Francine. Danny, thank you so much. Our Danny Berger there now still with us, Andrew Jamieson from Citigroup. Andrew, uh, we were looking at some of the ETF leaderboards. Our Danny Berger was showing us exactly um, what was happening in terms of outflows. What does it tell you? I mean, e ETF is a bit of a quirky market, if I can say so. So okay. does it actually tell you, a, you know, a story or could it just be because this week a couple of things were happening in it? Yeah, I think it's sometimes difficult to tell. I mean, clearly ETFs are often seen as a barometer for the market and the direction of travel. So they can be a good guide. So if you look at, for example, we talked previously about gold, 22 days of consecutive inflows certainly gives an indication about concerns around the global economy, trade wars, coronavirus, etc. I think sometimes looking at it in, in isolation, it can be challenging. As, as we touched on earlier, in, in Europe, it's very much an institutional market. So although these represent big inflows and outflows, they may in fact only be the, the, the rebalancing of a single asset manager or a single wealth platform. So sometimes it's hard to say, you know, is there a compelling reason why people are moving into France? It may only be one um, platform that's doing a bit of a reweighting. So uh, it, it can sometimes be difficult to tell. So there's nothing I would say that particularly resonates with me today. And again, from our perspective, um, we're very agnostic and, um, and we're here to serve people whether they want to buy and sell bond ETFs, equity ETFs or commodity ones. I mean, it's great that you're agnostic because it gives us like a really good picture of, you know, how you see things going. But something like the coronavirus, it, does it actually, tra you know, you see equity moves, you see currency moves, you see it's everywhere. Can you see those kind of moves in ETFs or is it just a little bit different? No, I, th I think you do. And, and I think that's, that's something that will evolve over the coming weeks and months, I think we, we're still in this uncertain period as to what the global economy is going to look like, 
I think we will see potentially more flows into safe havens if, if there is a concern that there's going to be a global downturn on the back of this, if movement is restricted. So I think that it's really a case of watch this space. Uh, I think currently it's hard to tell, um, but I think certainly we've seen over the last few years they are certainly uh, a sentiment barometer in terms of how people are investing. Great. Andrew, thanks so much. Andrew Jamieson from Citigroup stays with us. Now let's get passive aggressive and another sign of consolidation. Two of the oldest names in asset management are coming together to create a firm with one and a half trillion dollars in assets. Well, Franklin, Franklin Resources and Leg Mason will combine in an effort to compete as low cost index funds up in the industry. Just yesterday, also Morgan Stanley confirmed a deal to buy discount brokerage E-Trade for 13 billion dollars. While still with us, Andrew Jamieson from Citigroup. I mean, consolidation is here. How much more? consolidated will these market participants become? Well, I think we're just at the beginning and, and it's starting to accelerate and will continue to do so. I mean, you touched base there on uh, on Franklin with Leg. That's obviously the big news on a global stage. Last week in the UK, we had Jupiter and Marion. We've also seen Amundi and Pioneer, Aberdeen and Standard Life. We've seen Janice and Henderson. You know, th this is a trend that is going to continue. Really, it's about the squeezed middle. So there's a desire to get bigger, to be uh, able to, to derive economies of scale or stay small, niche and nimble. And it's really very difficult to compete in that uh, sort of five, 500 um, billion to, to a trillion level. So people really need to kind of move up and, and get global. I think what's also really interesting here uh, from an ETF standpoint is the tie up between Franklin and, and, and Leg is neither are established ETF players. They've both got relatively nascent small businesses. Um, but what's really interesting is whether they can become a powerhouse in non-transparent active. In the US, this is a really big thing. Uh, towards the tail end of last year, non-transparent active was approved. It's been in flight for many, many years, and finally the SEC approved it. The first model to be approved is a company called Presidian. Mm -hmm. uh, they were 25% owned by Leg Mason. Mm -hmm. They upped their stake to 75% uh, in the last few weeks. So they could potentially be a powerhouse in this new type of ETF. Andrew, thanks so much. Andrew Jamieson, this is Bloomberg.